There's no reason that Miami should have ever lost to FIU, whether it was this Saturday, next Saturday, five years, 10 years, 20 years. That is a team that you should never lose to, period. Um, and yeah, you know, it is, it continues to be a struggle for Miami. You're 0 and 3 after bye weeks this year. You lose to Virginia Tech, Georgia, oh, excuse me, North Carolina, Virginia Tech, and FIU in that order after bye weeks. You figure out a way to lose to a one win Georgia Tech team. Excuse me, I apologize. I thought I had that on mute. Um, but uh, you, you find a, a way to lose to a, a terrible Georgia Tech team who, after beating Miami, lost for a month straight until lo- uh, winning again this past weekend. So you you even think, okay, well, Georgia Tech, they're going to, you know, beat Miami and then another game. No, they lost to everybody else up until this last week. Um, It is it is terrible. It is atrocious. It is unacceptable. The level of performance that we are seeing from the Miami Hurricanes and to have to be out coached again in that kind of a way to have that kind of performance where you simply don't care. And I didn't, you know, I said it last last week on Friday, you know, that we were on here saying, you know, yeah, Miami should know by now. It's been proven and demonstrated that you cannot just go out there with a U on your chest or a Miami across the front wearing orange and green and white and saying, be on the basis of that alone, we're just going to win in a walkover. You have to go out there and earn it. You know, I remember, and I'm not even talking about very, very long ago, I remember when Miami would blow these teams out. Starters would play a half, and then you get the depth guys in there, and they're getting reps, and they're getting experience and things like that. Maybe it goes into the third or fourth quarter, but then you're still playing the second and third strings because you're blowing these teams out. But you went out there and did what you needed to do. And I've said this to you, Mark, for many, many years. When Miami does what Miami needs to do, everything is fine. This is another instance of Miami proving that they're not able to do what they need to do to play the way that they should play, finding ways to lose games to teams like this. It is terrible. And to the question that was on the screen, what's the latest on Justin Flo? There's been nothing reported, but it is hard for me to believe or think or consider that he's coming to Miami after that game on, on Saturday. It is, it is, it is a stretch of, of logic of the imagination of hope that, I am not sure that I can do anymore. And I know that Justin Flo is probably down to, I've seen it reported or or rumored that it was between Miami and Clemson, um, you know, where Miami's pushing the city of Miami as a big thing in that recruitment. He's vibing with it. You know, he's been down here, has family down here. Maybe, you know, he's an LA kid thinking, or Upland is just outside of LA, but you know, you're thinking, uh, yeah, that will be a, the connection that will bring him from the West Coast over here down to South Florida and things like that. Justin Flo, if you guys don't know, number five overall player in America, number one linebacker in this recruiting class. So, yeah, he's an elite player, as elite as it can get. It is hard to think that he would pick Miami now. And all again, all of the good efforts that the win against Pittsburgh and Florida State and Louisville – All of that momentum that you had, you undid in a major catastrophic way. So three steps forward, eight steps back with this lost FIU. Um, It's just absolutely terrible. What DeShust put it as great as possible in this comment. What a disaster. That's pretty much it uh, in a football sense, of course. That's uh, about what it is right now. And we've we've seen a few of these games where it felt like, okay, this is the low. This is the low. We hearken back to the Virginia game from years ago that shut down the Orange Bowl, in which, ironically, this game was played on the same ground of sorts. And, uh, of course, the Georgia Tech game was just this season, but it looked like uh, this team had turned the corner beating actually the better teams within the ACC on the schedule. Uh, Virginia, Louisville, Pitt, those might be the three best teams that they played in the ACC, and they won those games. So they've shown us what they're capable of. They weren't dominant efforts, but they beat those teams fair and square. But if they don't show up, this is 
the result. So obviously Manny Diaz is uh, the most accountable. He's responsible ultimately. But when you watch in watching the game, reviewing the game, what unit, what portion of the team is most responsible? Everyone. There is no one who is without blame, period. Um, from the staffers to the assistants to the grad assistants to the uh, receptionists at the Heck uh, Athletic Center to the coaches to the players, starters, scout team, uh, you know, there is no one who is without blame, period. Um, that is the kind of catastrophe that we saw. I even noted it in the good, the bad, and the ugly. Lewis Headley punted three times and had a 52-yard punt or per punt average. You're part of the problem because you're on the team. You know, football's a team sport. Sorry, buddy. Um, the offense was atrocious. I don't know why Jaron Williams was not pulled from that game. At a time, he was five for 17. Uh, actually, I have it still up. Um, yeah, Jaron was five for 17 including eight incompletions in a row and two interceptions built in there. And that was about when it was 23 to three FIU leading the game, by the way, I don't understand why he was not pulled from that game. That was, that was not good enough. You had thrown three interceptions in that, in those 17 throws two in the final eight, which were all incompletions. That's not to the standard. I don't care if it was Malik Rozier. I don't care if it was Nicosi Perry. I don't care if it was Jaron Williams. You're not playing good enough. And the stats at the end, because Miami is down a lot, and so you have to throw, and eventually, you know, they blew a couple coverages and you hit some guys, you know, deep. The stats look a little bit better at the end. But what are we talking about? You know what I mean? And, again, this is about Jaron Williams not doing the job. And I know that there are some people saying, Cam, well, you're just a Nicosi Perry fanboy. I don't care who the other quarterback was that you insert into the game. All I know is Jaron Williams wasn't doing good enough. He wasn't playing well enough to stay on the field. And if it were Nicosi Perry, if it were Malik Rozier, they would have gotten pulled. So to me, it's an imbalanced situation when you have a player who's clearly not playing well enough and you're ignoring that to continue to play him. That's not, and I don't care if it's Jaron. I don't care if it's, you know, D Wiggins who, I mean, you can say he quit on a route, but kudos to FIU for knowing this quarterback wants to run RPO slants. That's where he makes his money. That's where he, uh, get his bread is buttered by hitting those throws. So we're going to put a defender right in the way of that guy running that route. And D Wiggins stopped on the first interception. He ran literally physically ran into the, the defensive back and said, Oh, wait, uh, there's not supposed to be a guy there, but the guy was there. So now what are you supposed to do as a wide receiver? Continue your route and make them call the pass interference, but you didn't do that. So then Jaron throws it whoop, directly to the guy, then into triple coverage with no, no window open at all. And I saw what happened. The linebacker took one step up and then stopped because you're reading him early and saying, oh, if he's coming downhill, that's where I'm going to pull it and I'm going to throw it. So FIU tricked them or tricked him into throwing those interceptions. But if FIU was, and they were, the 114th ranked running defense, rush defense in the country, why are you not running the ball, Danny knows? Not play action, not RPO, call an actual run play and run the ball. Why? Because they can't stop it. But no. You want to do those kind of things, right? Then you go quarterback power uh, with a with a DJ Dallas lead block on fourth and goal from the one. Now, Zion Nelson whipped his guy, threw him to the ground. Unfortunately, when he did that, the defender then went through DJ Dallas's legs, which took away the lead blocker. There were still two other guys out there. So even if DJ Dallas makes that block, there's still two other guys. And you know what? On that play, Mike Harley is in the slot. And nobody from FIU looked at him before, during, or after that play. Mike Harley could be standing in the end zone to this day, to this second right now, and nobody from FIU would have noticed yet four days later. But you don't have the advantage or the ability to, to alter the play, to do a side adjustment and say, hey, it's fourth and goal, and there's a guy over there that nobody's paying attention to. 
So I'm going to give him the ball. You don't do that. I don't understand how every team that Miami plays watches film, changes game plans to affect Miami offensively and defensively. And Miami has no answer. This is what I was talking about earlier in the year, how Miami comes out slowly every single game, almost all year long. How are you not prepared? How do you not see these things? If everybody knows that you're going to run RPO slants, maybe you have something else in there. And Danny knows was talking about, yeah, you know, Jaron Williams, his development can be maybe we get to the second or third tier, the second or third option on these things. Maybe you run some plays to take advantage of the defense instead. And I'm not saying it is only Jaron's fault. I'm not saying it is only Dan Enos's fault. I'm not saying that, you know, the rotation on defense and that last touchdown run, you know, you you have in a backup there, Gilbert Frierson. I think he's going to be a good player here, but you have a backup player at striker. He fills the wrong gap. Anthony Jones is out the back door. That's the touchdown, which you know, was an FIU football and their whole university is still celebrating it, saying this is the biggest touchdown in FIU history. This is the biggest moment in FIU history because you have second string defenders in on a key play and he fills a bad uh, run gap fit and then boom, the guy is gone. It is not only his fault. It is not only Blake Baker's fault. It is not only anybody's fault. 